Hi, my name is Mitra Manesh. I'm a servant. I serve through teaching, coaching, consulting, or any other way that I can find to share what I know with those who want to know. And this Lights On podcast is one of those ways. It was created with consciousness and mindful living in heart. So join us as we travel through many roads of learning and transformation together. And if you enjoy our podcast, please give us feedback by rating us five star and share us with others if you think they may benefit from it. On behalf of my team, I thank you for your presence. This episode is a coaching episode. Every now and then I coach someone that I don't know and I've uh, never coached them before. And uh, they usually surprise me with their questions and, and what they need from the coaching session. But they always end up being a very interesting session. This particular session, I was coaching a woman uh, named Maggie. Uh, that's the name she chose for herself. And um, it started with um, Maggie wanting to uh, forgive someone that had harmed her and uh, her child uh, many years ago. So on the surface, the question was, uh, how do I forgive this person? And of course, we unfolded what forgiveness even means, because we usually believe that um, the person that we want to forgive needs to qualify and be uh, forgivable, if you like. And then, of course, many people don't qualify if we um, condition our forgiveness on that. But something even deeper and more interesting uh, came to the surface as we were speaking about forgiving other people. Uh, it became apparent that Maggie really needed to start forgiving herself. And it ended up being a very interesting conversation. Anyways, let's take a listen together. And I hope that you enjoy listening to this as much as um, Maggie and I enjoyed the session. Um, also, just wanted to add that I heard from Maggie um, a few days later, and uh, she told me how much lighter she felt, even though this was a short session and we didn't do really deep work that I normally do with my clients in, in coaching sessions. And um, nevertheless, it had been helpful for her. And I hope that somehow this session be helpful for you. Hi, and welcome to this coaching episode. I am speaking with Maggie, and uh, we're going to be, uh, I don't know, talking about something that I don't know what it is. So hi, Maggie, and welcome to our coaching podcast. Thank you, Mitra. Hello. Hi. So tell me, I mean, if it was a real coaching session, uh, real, uh, I would be asking you to basically start anywhere that you want to start. Tell me a little bit about you as much as you feel comfortable. And also tell me um, if uh, there is any particular subject that you want to talk about, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Um, I'm not really sure how to... Like go about saying what I am and um like about me. Um I'm single, I'm a stay at home mom. Um I've got two wonderful kids. Um but I have a hard time letting go of something that happened to me in the past. Mm -hmm. And I know that what happened was wrong and it wasn't my fault, but I just, I can't, I can't move past it. It's like, I, I am having a hard time giving them a second chance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm hearing a lot of emotions here. Um, is there anything I can say or do to make it more comfortable? And do you feel comfortable moving forward and telling me and us about what do you mean by that? I'm feeling pretty comfortable um, 
it's, I was worried it was going to be like a trauma dump. And I, I don't want to cross any boundaries there, but um, um, my first, or my ex-husband was um, mentally and verbally abusive. Um, he was an alcoholic and he was a drug addict. And he has since cleaned himself up. He's gotten married and he's a wonderful dad to her kid. But um, 10 years ago, um, he kind of held me and my kids hostage in a car for over an hour, driving mm-hmm. at ridiculous speeds. Um, my youngest was only five weeks old. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to get past that. It, it's... I know he's not the same person, but it's like I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop and for him to turn back into that person. And I'm worried he's going to hurt my kids the way he hurt me. And he's, he's done nothing recently to make me believe he would, Mm -hmm. but I just, I can't, I can't move forward with it. And I'm I'm feeling stuck. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be a victim. I don't want to be have that victim mindset. But I just, I can't get past it. Mm-hmm. Wow. First of all, I'm really sorry to hear that. I can just imagine. I don't know. I can only imagine how hard that may be for a mother with two young kids, one only a few weeks old. Uh, as a mother, I can just, wow, that would be really, really hard to take. But when you said moving past this, are you speaking about, because I'm hearing two things. One is inwardly, meaning um, how do I move forward? How do I, for instance, bad word, but forgive him? And are you also saying how to bring him back to life of my kids and have some interactions with him? Is that what you mean? Yes, um, kind of, kind of both because I, I know I can't have him in their life until I deal with my own um, insecurities about it. Meaning, he's not part of your children's life right now. Not right now, um, because the kids just didn't want to go back. Does he want to be? I don't know. I I can't tell if he wants to be in the boy's life or if his wife thinks that they are supposed to be in their lives. Like that's just part of the normal. And, mm-hmm. You know, she's kind of telling him that he's supposed to be in their lives when mm-hmm. I, I don't think he has any interest. Interesting. What about your children? Do the boys want to have him somehow in in their life? Um, Sometimes they do. Like they'll say they want to go for a visit, but they don't want to spend the night with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I mean, he he, he comes to their birthday parties and and, uh, Christmas and holidays. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Really, um, I'm just trying to find out what the question is, because sounds like somehow, in a very small way, he is involved in their lives. They do not go and spend a weekend or night there, but they do go and visit, correct? Um, occasionally. Like, I think they've been twice this year. Mm-hmm. And your question is, um, I let me tell you why I'm asking this question. I feel your question is mainly inwardly as opposed to outwardly. And if I were you, if I was in that situation, I would start inwardly and then from inwardly resolution or lack thereof, then you can make a decision outwardly. Um, so let's go to... Um, the time that you felt how you felt and is your major obstacle I'm assuming and please correct my assumption is your major obstacle uh the fact that you cannot go past that 
it's a simple way of saying you cannot forgive him for what he has done. Yes, I think I think that's exactly it. Okay. So forgiveness is such a complex uh, subject and, and experience because sometimes when we speak about or think about, consider forgiveness, we are seeking a few things. One, we want the person to qualify for forgiveness. We want this person to show us that they didn't mean it, or if they meant it, they were not in a mental position to make that decision right, or more importantly, that they will never do it again. And these conditions make it almost impossible for the forgiveness to take place because how, how can I make sure that somebody else never ever does something wrong, especially if this person has done something wrong already, as I have a point of reference and experience. I'm going to stop and say, ask you, is this how you see forgiveness? Do you feel he needs to qualify and he needs to make sure that he doesn't do that ever again before you can consider forgiveness? Yeah, I, I think, yeah. Okay, so... This is going to be a little bit challenging. Forgiveness has got nothing to do with the person that needs to be forgiven. Forgiveness is a gift to you, Maggie. Because obviously, 10 years later, you still are carrying this really heavy memory and incident on your back. And you know, as a single mother with two kids... Two boys, I can just imagine you already have a heavy load. You don't need extra weight on your back. So this is not about your ex-husband. And he may never qualify. I don't know where he is in life. And I have no way, and neither do you, of knowing what happened and what makes a person to go to that place. But I can just ask you if we shifted the conditions of forgiveness and said the forgiveness is a gift you give to you and not to him. How would that, if any, change the way you see forgiveness? And do you have any objections or questions about that? I think that's spot on exactly what I need because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always here with me. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. You forgive him, not because he's worthy of forgiveness, because I don't know what that means even. You're forgiving him because this weight is just too heavy for you to carry. And it's there is no need for it. And by forgiveness, we really are talking about the fact that you accept what has happened, except I don't mean agreement. You're not, I'm not saying, go oh, put a happy face on it. Oh, it doesn't matter what happened. No, it's none of those. It's really acknowledging what happened was really petrifying and was very, very terrible thing that happened. But it happened. It happened. And you can never, ever change what happened. You can change your relationship with what happened. And that's a huge, powerful um right that you have as a person who's experienced that. And now my question to you changes because the question was, does he qualify? Does, does he deserve? I think that's the right phrase. People say, this person does not deserve. And I'm saying, it's got nothing to do with them. It's got to do with you. Because is there any guilt around this for you? I want to ask. There, there is because I'm, it, as a mom, I feel like I should have been able to see it. I should have been able to stop it. And yeah. I didn't. Really? Really? As the mom, five weeks after giving birth, you should have been able to stop a man that is strong and obviously out of control. Is that a good expectation? Is that reasonable? Would you would you expect that from me if I was your friend, your neighbor? No. 
Yeah. And why do you expect it from you then? I don't know. Oh, I'm going to say something very hard. You know, Maggie, the person you need to forgive probably is you. Tell me what's happening for you because our listeners cannot see you. I can see you nodding, but they can see you. I, I do. I, I need to be able to forgive myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because your expectation of yourself is pretty harsh and honestly a little bit unreasonable. Is your ex-husband stronger than you physically? Yes. Was he in a state of uh, mind or consciousness that it was safe to stop him? No. No. So where did this expectation come from? If I told you this story and I said I was in a car after five weeks after giving birth with two young kids and I had a man who was not in the right state and I think it was my fault that he did that and I should have been able to stop him. What would you tell me? That it's not your fault. It's not you. It has nothing to do with you. It's It's him. And there was nothing you could do. Maggie, how do we forgive ourselves? How do we do that? I don't know. (laughs) I think you do. I think you're very um, cognizant of the fact that, that this is unreasonable, what you're asking yourself. And what you're really expecting of yourself is very unreasonable. And I think maybe the not what is really stuck there is um, an expectation that is unreasonable from you. But also, I I don't know. Tell me about where was he at conscious-wise and state of health or where was he at? Tell me a little bit more about that. Um, He was very drunk. Mm -hmm. he has a way or he had a way of um, hiding how drunk he was he didn't Mm -hmm. slur he didn't he could walk the straight line Mm -hmm. it was just I had no idea until until it was too late Mm -hmm. I'm going to, going to ask a very silly question. What's in it for you to hold on to this lack of forgiveness of yourself? Nothing. There's nothing in it for me. Are you done feeling bad for yourself and about yourself? Yes. Are you really ready to let it go because sometimes we're not and that's fine but my question is do you see that what you're asking of yourself is extremely unreasonable yes um i can find it a lot easier to be gentle with other people Mm. because you're right i would i would never tell somebody that was in my position that it was their fault Mm. Yeah. Yet you expect yourself to. Yeah. You see, I always say this is a funny thing. The way we treat ourselves, if we treated other people, they either leave us or sue us. (laughs) Just think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So really, let's make it about you and let's just uh, move forward with that. And and maybe uh, there are some statements that might be helpful. They usually is a mindfulness practice that we put our hand on our heart and we say, for all the wrongdoings that I have done, knowingly or unknowingly, for the hurt that I may have caused myself and others, knowingly or unknowingly, I now 
forgive myself. Can you say that? For all the hurt that I've done, I forgive myself. Mm -hmm. All the wrongs that I've done, I forgive myself. Mm -hmm. And I see that your hand isn't on your heart. Doesn't it feel good? It feels like there's support there. Our hand is very healing. And when we put it on our heart, it actually allows us to feel and take our attention to our heart. And this is not about like some nice mindfulness words that we're saying. We really need to see that as human beings, we have come to learn and grow. If I knew everything I needed to know, if I was really capable of not making any mistakes, I probably wouldn't be in a physical body in this physical third dimensional life. I probably would be if there are any beings that have wings and know exactly what to do and say all the time. I'll be one of those. So really understanding the true nature of our humanness and allowing something that we may not know. And then allowing ourselves to move forward. Tell me about your motherhood. Tell me how, what kind of a mother are you to your sons? Um, I'm very observant. <laughs> um, they were diagnosed as autistic when they were younger, so I am hyper vigilant with them. Um, I'm very involved. They know where they're at and try to know how they're feeling. Mm. I try to be supportive and make sure they know they're loved. I have a very difficult question for you. Maggie, can you do that for yourself? Exactly what you explained to me that you do and how you treat your children, your sons. Can you be loving and observant and caring for yourself? I can. Have It'll you been you think? <laughs> Well, no, you have practice. No, 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 no. I'm going to take you on. You have practice. You have practice on two people for many, many years. You don't need practice. You just need to believe that you deserve it and you should be really treating yourself just as loving and caring as you do your children. Where is the belief that says Maggie should not be treating herself loving, but she should be a great mother, a loving mother, an observant mother, and very vigilant about her responsibilities? Where, where, where? Tell me what belief says that Maggie doesn't deserve to be loved and cared and observed and heard. I would love to say it was somebody else's fault but mm -hmm. i i let my mind get that way mm -hmm. you know instead of fighting back and pushing back and I'm, feel like i'm getting better but but yeah i believe what someone else thought of me mm -hmm. yeah or said that they thought of you so there are three aspects of us, Maggie, that makes us who we are. There is our genetics. There is our history, whatever you have experienced so far, including what we're talking about. And then there is, and usually we leave it at that. So when you ask me, Mitra, why are you like this? I say, oh, it's because my mother did this and my father died when I was young and my, uh, and I can go on and on. Or I can say genetically, you should have met my grandparents. You know, they're like this, they're like that. So what I'm saying is that I have no other way of being differently. Where we forget between the genes and the history on the top of a triangle, there sits my choice. That means that what I'm going to do 
with this ingredients, two ingredients that life has offered me. You know, it's like a, um, I don't have TV, but there are programs, they tell me that they give ingredients to chefs and say, go and make something and that they choose the best one. It's exactly like that. So if the, the third aspect, if the choice wasn't there, then we would be all identical with those that we share genes and history with. And we know that's not the case. Look at our siblings. I mean, I can't think of anybody more different than at least one of my siblings than me. It's like 180 degrees. So what happened? We had same parents. We grew up in the same household. We have same genes. But somebody asked some other questions. And it's not about good or bad or higher or lower. It's about the fact that you have to activate that choice that sits on the top of that triangle. And when we do that, then we see that both the what's called bad genes and bad history, they both become a tool for our growth. So the very same thing, if you look at the motivational speakers, the very same thing that they say in order to show you what a long way they have come as a motivational speaker, they could have said it in order to tell you what a victim they are in life. I'm sure you've noticed, and I know that I have noticed, that motivational speakers usually exaggerate their, you know, their bad fortune or their like really shortcomings in life. The reason for that is that they want to show you, see, this is what I've overcome. One week I slept in the car, I tell you I was homeless for years. The reason for that is because it's much more attractive. So long way to go around this. Now, my question to you, Maggie, is if you could activate your choice, if you did have a say, what would be the story that you write about your life, considering the genes you have and the history you have had so far until this day that you and I are speaking? I have picked myself up. Um. I didn't think that I could do anything by myself. And I've been able to raise these boys. Um, I've been able to hold down an amazing job, <laughs> even though it's freelance. And sometimes I can only work a few hours a week. Um, I was able to pull myself up and get my college degree, which was huge <laughs> I just need to be kinder and gentler to myself the way I would speak to anybody else <laughs> thank you so you've already activated my answer is you've already activated your choice because you have made many good choices and you didn't let yourself be the victim of your genes or your history so now the question is how do I do it more consciously and more as an observant person that you are? Because you use that word. I'm very observant of my kids. Can you be observant of the way you treat yourself so that you can more and more activate your choice points and choice consciousness in order to make better decisions that will serve you, your life, and consequently the children's life? Yes, I can. So you see, it's just as simple as that. I know it sounds crazy, but it's simple as that. Does it go away? Do you never think about that? Answer? Of course not. I mean, I don't, nobody has a magic wand, but it's a turning point that from this time, I've decided that the very thing that I could tell you to get tears in your eyes are going to be the reason for the strength and the kindness that I'm going to show in, in relationship to myself. Now, the question is, are you ready to do that? Yes. Have you suffered enough? Yes. Is this a good time for you to do that? Yes. Simple as that. That's all you need. A decision to do what I call a U-turn. You just did a U-turn. And you're going to mess up and you're going to forget and you're going to hear the voice saying, oh, God, blah, I can't believe I did that. And that's fine. 
But that observant person, that wonderful mother that you are, can also mother you in moments like that and say, you know what? It's okay. You've got a lot to do. This is, oh, I got shivers. This is what happened when I was, um, it's amazing how similar our stories are and we don't know as human beings. I was um, a single mother and I was taking care of my kids and holding two jobs. And it was a Saturday morning and I had like five appointments to attend to. And I made a mistake. I went to the second appointment first instead of, you know, I showed up and they said, oh, your appointment is not until 11 o'clock. And I remember I said, oh, my God, I'm so stupid. And I remember my daughter was very young and she held my hand and she said, mom, you're not stupid. You just have too much to do. And I remembered I started crying and I said, that's so true. I have so much to do. This is a Saturday. This is the day that people usually rest. And I have five appointments and all the other things that I have to do. Yet I was like a horrible stepmother to myself. I would never talk to my child like that, but I did talk to myself like that. So I always remembered that, always. Any time that I want to be harsh on myself, I remember what my little girl told me, and she really was little at that time. And she said, no, you're not stupid. So I want that little girl to come to you. I want to lend her hand to you. And I want you to imagine every time you are unkind to yourself. And see that little girl, be it you or any child, doesn't matter. There's a wonderful little girl somewhere that can hold your hand and say, no, you're not silly. No, you're not this and that. You just have way too much to do. And you know what? You're doing a great job. Thank you. Do you believe my words? I do. Can you feel them in your body? Can you remember them for the time that you need them? Yes. You need to practice. The only difference between how you treated yourself before this conversation and now is that you had practiced harshness. And now I want you to practice kindness, kindness to you. And I think then your ex-husband almost becomes irrelevant. Yes, what he did was very wrong. Yes, you have to be um, cautious about how accessible your children are to him. I understand that. But yes, also, they need to have some relationship unless it's not safe for them with their father. They chose this father and they can handle this father. You can't walk the streets of life with them, protecting them forever. Again, unless you tell me that he's still violent and, and, and I'm hearing that he's not. Yeah, he's not. He's not violent, no. Okay. And he is not um, on medication, taking drugs or alcohol? I think he still drinks, but not as bad. Okay. And sounds like his uh, current wife has a sense of family and she wants your children there, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. That's a, that's a good sign. So you have some supervision there. And do you feel your kids are um, mature enough to sort of defend themselves or call you if they're feeling uncomfortable? We're still learning that. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're still learning that. Mm-hmm. So that would be a good thing to do as far as doing is concerned to make sure that they have a way out if this gets uncomfortable for them. But um, the most important part of this conversation was really your relationship with yourself and the shift that needs to happen there. And once you practice the forgiveness for you, maybe you can start practicing forgiving him or just sustaining with whatever because sometimes forgiveness is too far so you can do the same practice putting your hand on your heart and saying i am ready to consider forgiveness that's all step by step and if that feels too much don't do it and leave it and then practice self-forgiveness and go back to practicing forgiveness for him when and if you feel you're comfortable 
forgiveness is a process. It's a very long process. But yeah, I think the most important part was the switch that, that I feel on your face. I can see it. Unfortunately, the listeners can't see your face, but I'm seeing a huge shift. All right, let's take a deep breath together. Is there anything else that you want to ask, say, or share? No, I think that was that was it. I, I already feel a huge weight kind of lifted. Wow, that's amazing. All right, thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable and allowing me to be privy to your information. Thank you. Hope this episode answered the question or two for you or provoked and inspired questions in you. I'm so grateful you showed up and listened up. Until the next time, be well and stay curious.